Africa Prime, brought to you by Jamison Select Reserve. Welcome back. You're watching Africa Prime and still with me is South African Minister in the Presidency, Trevor Manuel. As the former Finance Minister in South Africa, we experienced a surplus for two years. Many say that now we've actually gone backwards with regards to where we are on the deficit front. We're taking a counter-cyclical approach to ensure that the devastation that occurred on a global level does not filter through into South Africa. We could actually see debt to GDP reaching 40% by 2014. Is this the right approach? You know, I think it's, it's, it's important to, to recognize that one of the ways uh, out of uh, a deep economic slump uh, is actually spending, but you need to be able to spend wisely, and the wise spending is is on infrastructure. And you know, I, I belong to a, a school of thought that says it's not just physical infrastructure like concrete and asphalt; it's also human infrastructure. Human capacity is a fundamentally important part of that investment spending. We've got to get that right, uh, and uh, uh, the only way to do it is by deficit financing. So I don't think that, that we have to lose sleep about deficits. We need to lose sleep about the quality of spending. Vision 2030, which of course has been put together by the Central Planning Commission, which of course you're heading up, some argue that it is slightly too grandiose, that we cannot achieve the targets that you put in place with regards to alleviating poverty and ensuring that we do see strong job growth in South Africa. What is your response to that criticism? You know, the, the, the broad approach that we've taken in the National Planning Commission is that it's, it's not magic, it's not detailed macroeconomic simulations. We need to change the way in which decisions are taken. And we're looking at a, a big shift in that part of democracy. And so we're looking, we actually, the National Planning Commission wants active citizenry. We want people to be a, to have voice and to take control over the public services that impact on their lives. We express concern that school governing bodies don't work in poor communities. We express concern that community police forums don't work in poor communities. We want people to have voice and we think that as you, ha as you give people voice and as we do the things necessary to amplify the voice of communities, we will in fact be strengthening democracy because there's a better engagement between public representatives and the communities that they serve and that is one part of it. The second part that, that we include is, is the issue of leadership. And leadership is not a notion of one single individual or even a cabinet, we, we, we're thinking of, of leadership that, that obtains in the school, on the factory floor, in the village. It has to be all the way through society. People have to raise the issues that impact on them. And, and that, I think, will, will, will lay a better basis for democracy. And the third part of it is a capable state. We should not, in a democracy, tolerate less than the best services for people. Uh, and, and the issues of capability are there. We've seen in South Africa departments that were pretty decrepit, such as the Department of Home Affairs, has actually undergone a very significant turnaround. Uh, I use that as demonstration of the fact that with a bit of effort, we will be able to turn other departments around. Uh, it's going to mean that, that uh, we need uh, a voice in Parliament that is more resonant, uh, that will ask the tough questions, that will hold uh, governments to account, not just at national level but also at provincial levels. Uh, also, we must ensure that, that, that local government operates much better. Uh, if we do that, then we will in fact be focusing on the capability of the state and once you have a capable state, the quality of services will increase. And as we do that, I think there's a basis for a better conversation. It's that conversation that we don't have because we, we, we seem to believe that uh, all you need are smart people who know how to program computers and voila, you solve the problems. How do we implement the targets that you've put in place? Some would say that implementation has been the biggest issue, not only in South Africa, but on the rest of the African continent, and that is where we always fail. 
Look, a lot of the, the I mean, if you look at the, the proposals we have in the plan, there are uh, 87 different proposals. Uh, in fact, they add up, if you take the sub-bullets, to, to just under 100. Now, these are not sequential. They can be done simultaneously. We should be working in education, ensuring that schools are more accountable to the communities that they serve, ensuring that we are training school principals to be capable managers, ensuring that we can identify uh, those instances where teachers need retraining. We can do all of those things while we're at the same time improving on the quality of health care and also dealing with the rural communities so that we can improve on agricultural output, provide facilitation to newly settled farmers and ensure that we can see through uh, the very important land redistribution. These are not things that need to wait on each other. All that we need is, is a way in which we, we set about working and the way in which we, we can account for the actions actually taken. Minister, when you look at social considerations versus climate considerations, do you think that a balance can be struck between the two? You don't need to find a balance between the two. You know, um, across the African continent, for instance, uh, uh, most, most people, most of the billion people on this continent don't actually have electricity uh, available. They can't turn on a light switch in their house uh, or in their village. Uh, and so, you know, it isn't even the shift between cheap uh, coal-fired energy uh, and a new green energy. Just having energy available uh, will, be very, will bring a very significant change to the lives of the majority. Um, in, in, in the case of South Africa, where we've kind of been reared on a, a, a unsustainable environment of very uh, low cost uh, uh, electricity, uh, that has had to change. Uh, it's not popular, but it has had to change uh, as a consequence of decisions of NERSA, as a consequence also of the need to uh, uh, improve on, on the output and the consistency and reliability of energy uh, from, from ESCOM. Uh, but, you know, I think it changes for all time. Now we need to focus on a series of other issues. We need to focus on uh, ensuring that we don't emit uh, as much carbon as we do. I don't think that, that we're suggesting as a planning commission that we can go off coal entirely. Um, but we must invest in the research and development to ensure that South Africa does have clean coal technologies that is lower emitting and cleaner. South Africa is embarking on a nuclear strategy that of course has been put in place, but do you think that it is a solution for Africa? Uh, no, I think the best solution for Africa is actually hydro and Africa has enormous potential. Uh, the Inga uh, prospects on the uh, Congo River uh, has the capability, Grand Inga has the capability of producing sufficient energy for all of the African continent. It'll be clean and green. And if you add in other potential such as that available in the Central African Republic, it comes back to us. We can do this quite differently. Uh, we might even be able to re-engineer some of the Lesotho Highlands to be able to get more, more hydropower from it. Um, the other, the other um, uh, elements that people are chasing Africa has in abundance. Uh, that's water. We have sunlight uh, in abundance and so I, I, I fervently believe that the breakthrough, the game changes in respect of uh, solar energy will actually come from the African continent. I know that Spain has, has made tremendous progress uh, in their concentrated uh, photovoltaic, but I think that, that, that we're likely to leapfrog them. Uh, and similarly, there's a lot of wind and, and some of the, 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 the wind power generated uh, I don't know, but it must be a very high double-digit percentage that the Canary Islands are already generating from, from wind power. So we can do these things. But at the end of the day, it actually comes down to funding. It does come down to funding, uh, which is why all of these people around us have gathered in Durban. One of the issues on the chopping block is agreement on a green climate fund. Um, you know, and, and we have to go back to Copenhagen in 2009 when there was a decision to establish a, uh, uh, a fund that will receive about $100 billion a year. Uh, 
and that's a large amount of money. $100 billion a year is a large amount of money, uh, and it's a flow from the developed to the developing world. Uh, and in Cancun last year, there was agreement that a Green Climate Fund be, be, be established. Uh, I was, I was co-chair of the Transitional Committee that has had the responsibility over these past uh, nine months to design the fund. We've placed the design of the fund before this conference. Many developed countries have actually come out and been very vocal with regards to the guilt fee that they feel they have to pay. Do you agree with this guilt fee that they are alluding to? And essentially it is about the industrialized nations versus the nations that haven't been industrialized and we're talking about the African continent. Well that is, that is in the nature of the agreement struck. Uh, uh, and, and the heads of state were there, you know. Uh, it's important to remind ourselves that a number of uh, European uh, heads of government and heads of, of state were there. Barack Obama was there. Uh, Hu Jintao, uh, Chinese uh, president, was there. President Zuma was there. Uh, they all got together and said, this hundred billion needs to flow in this way. It's not guilt money, it's developmental resources. It's very important that we're not treated as guilt, but as development needs. Uh, and this is what's on the block here. And we must ensure that that money flows and that it does what it's meant to do. Minister, thank you for sharing your insights. Great to have you on the program.